This is going to be part three of the Hebrews overview. And once again, Hebrews has 13 chapters, 303 verses, around 6,913 words. Hebrews means to pass over. The theme is better things brought by the Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, how Jesus brought better things, how he's superior to certain things. The author is Paul, and we made it to chapter 7. So chapter 7, the book of Hebrews, and in this we're going to see how he is superior to Aaron's priesthood. Hebrews seven twenty two through 24. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. And they truly were many priests, because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. The Old Testament priests were sinners and died. Jesus Christ, our high priest, is so much better, because Jesus Christ is sinless. He died voluntarily, not because he was a sinner, but because he died voluntarily for our sins. And he became the ultimate sacrifice for sin. But he, but then he resurrected and continues forever. That's why it says, But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Hebrews 7.25 Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. You come to God through him. He's your intercessor. He's the only way to God. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by him. Anybody trying to get, get up some other way is a thief and a robber. You don't need a Catholic priest. You don't need a Pope. You have to have the blood of the Lord Jesus. Hebrews 7, 26. For such an high priest became us. He took up on him the likeness of a servant, the likeness of a man, 1 Timothy 3.16 Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. He became us, who was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Jesus Christ became us. He took on the likeness of men. He defeated the devil, defeated temptation, defeated death, defeated hell and the grave. He became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He's holy, even though we aren't holy. He ate with publicans and sinners, but at the same time, he is separate from sinners. It says in Hebrews 7, 27, Who needeth not daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins, and then for the people's. For this he did once, when he offered up himself. He's a better priest because he doesn't have to offer a sacrifice for his own sins. He, didn't, he did no sin. Neither was God found in his mouth. He doesn't have to offer up sacrifices daily, because the sacrifice he did on the cross was a one-time thing that was good enough to take away all sin. You just got to accept the payment that he paid. The blood of those animal sacrifices that those priests in the Old Testament did could not take away sin. You had to offer them over and over and over again. But the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ permanently takes away sin. Jesus is a better high priest with a better priesthood. Chapter 8, he has a superior covenant. He's got a better covenant. Hebrews 8, 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry. He's got a more excellent ministry. But how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. He's got a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Remember the theme of Hebrews? Jesus bringing better things. You know, they got that silly campaign slogan or whatever, build back better. But that's all a joke. The only one that can make things better is the Lord Jesus. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. You see, it, uh, it was had faults. Jesus Christ has no faults. For finding fault with them, he saith, The days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant 
with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. He's going to restore them. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. Now, me and you aren't Israel. So why in the world would somebody think that we have replaced Israel when he's going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel? He says, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. Now, obviously, this is future. How can you say that this has already happened? This is future, and he it shows he's going to have a new covenant with the house of Israel in the future. So this shows that God's not done with Israel, even though right now they're blind in part. For the most part, Israel rejects Jesus Christ. They don't believe he's God, he was God manifest in the flesh. They don't believe he's the Son of God at all. But there's going to be a time when they do. They're going to be restored. They're going to know Jesus is who he says he is. And they're not going to have to teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. All is going to know who Jesus is from the least to the greatest because he's going to be sitting on a throne in Jerusalem, and everybody's going to be able to walk up to him and see him. He says, For I will be merciful to their, unright to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. So he's going to put all that that they did in the past. He's not going to remember it no more. It's just like he does for us. The moment you got saved, your sins and iniquities he'll remember no more. In that he saith the new covenant, he hath made the first old, now that which decayeth and waxeth old is, is ready to vanish away. When we're in the millennium, the Jews are going to get that land that was promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God isn't going to remember how they failed him throughout time. Israel won't be judged as a nation anymore. The, the judgment will be over. You see, they go through the judgment of the tribulation. The tribulation is God's judgment on Israel. That's why it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. And you won't have to go around saying, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, because everybody will know who Jesus Christ is and what he stands for. It's going to be very made very clear what's re required of them. Jesus has a better covenant, a superior covenant. He's going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel. And chapter 9, he's got superior blood. Hebrews 9, 11 through 12. But Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle. So he's got a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. That is to say, not of this building. You know, this is a heavenly one. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. Acts twenty twenty eight says he purchased us with his own blood. But by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So the blood of those bulls and the goats can't take away sin. When those people sacrificed those animals, shed their blood, all those things were just pictures and types of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, that takes away the sin of the world. But they could never make anybody perfect. Hebrews 9.13, For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ? You see, the blood of Christ does so much more. Who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. If the blood of bulls and goats can give temporary forgiveness of sin in the Old Testament, how much more do you think the blood of Jesus Christ can do? It not only saves your soul, but it can purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. When you mess up and sin, you can just go to God, confess it, forsake it. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Come confess your sin, and in the sense of a, a daily cleansing, he... he the blood can do wonders for you, and you can go right on serving. Hebrews nine sixteen through 17 
For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. That's Jesus. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. These two verses explain how the New Testament did not actually officially begin until the death of the testator. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. So when you go back there and read the Gospels, you're reading in Matthew. It's in the New Testament part of your Bible, but since the, a testament is not a force after men are dead and is of no strength at all while the testator liveth, the New Testament doesn't actually start in Matthew until Jesus dies on the cross. The New Testament doesn't officially start in Mark and Luke until Jesus dies on the cross. Hebrews 9.24, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Jesus Christ didn't take his blood into the holy places on earth that are made with men's hands. He went up to the third heaven into those, into those made without hands, those places made without hands. And those ones down here just picture the, the real thing. But Jesus went into heaven itself, and he appeared in the presence of God for me and you. He is a better high priest. Hebrews 9.25, Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered, entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. The high priest had to go in there many times with the shed blood of those animals. It was a never-ending cycle. Your sacrifice was only good then until sin came up again. But with Jesus, it's a one-time thing. Hebrews 9.26, For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Jesus Christ was manifested to take away our sins. That's why he came. He came down to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. It says in Hebrews 9.27, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin into salvation. He once suffered for the sins of many. Once suffered. He didn't have to do it more than once. It was a one-time thing that he died for the sins of many. Many being everybody. You say, well, many doesn't sound like everybody. Well, everybody's many, ain't they? If you put everybody ever together, that's many people. Chapter 10, you got a superior sacrifice. Jesus is the superior sacrifice. Hebrews 10, 1 through 4. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. See, those sacrifices they did in the Old Testament wasn't doing any good when it came to getting their sins cleared. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. You know, if they was doing any good, they wouldn't have to keep offering them over and over and over. Because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance, again, made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Jesus Christ is a better sacrifice, and those Old Testament sacrifices could never clear people permanently for their sin, and if they did, why did they just keep doing them over and over and over? Then said he, Lo, I come to do the will, thy will, O God. In Hebrews 10, 9, He taketh away the first that, first, that he may establish the second, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all just one time he won't have to do it again we're sanctified through him that means he sets us apart and every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins because jesus is a greater sacrifice if the sacrifice of jesus christ you know a lot of people think that people in the old testament were just looking forward to the cross and had the same salvation going on that me and you have today. They think they were born again, sealed, saved, sealed into the day of redemption in the body of Christ, the blood on their record. That makes no sense at all. If that's true, why were they doing these bloody animal sacrifices over and over and over? Wouldn't the blood of Jesus Christ cleanse them from all sin? Think about it. 
How does that make any sense? If the sacrifice of Jesus Christ was applied to the Old Testament saints in the Old Testament time period, then why did God have, have them even bother with the bloody animal sacrifices that can never take away sins? What would be the point? Now, obviously, we know that God saw through his foreknowledge that he was going to come down, die on the cross for our sins, be buried and resurrected. Obviously, we know that. But I don't believe that he applied the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross to believers in the Old Testament before that sacrifice even took place. You say, well, it was only to show... You say, you know, well, the, the animal sacrifices was just to show them that the Lamb of God was coming to take away the sin of the world. It was a picture of that. Well, of course, it was, it was a pic. The bloody animal sacrifices were a picture of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the Lamb without blemish and without spot. But remember, these, these animal sacrifices were also giving them temporary forgiveness as well. So it doesn't make any sense for you to say that they had the blood of Jesus applied to them, but yet they were still doing the bloody animal sacrifices. Because if they had the blood of Jesus applied to them on their soul, they would have had their sins cleared permanently, never to come back. Past, present, future sins forgiven. He wouldn't have, God wouldn't have remembered them no more. But they were still doing these bloody animal sacrifices that was giving them temporary forgiveness. You can't have both. That doesn't make any sense for you to have both going on. So it, the uh, Old Testament saints were not getting the blood of Jesus applied to them. It doesn't make any sense to say that. And if... If they were, why give the Old Testament saints a temporary forgiveness for sins through the shed blood of animals if God was applying the spotless blood of Jesus Christ to them? If they were just saying, hey, I believe the Messiah is coming. I'm looking forward to the cross. I'm looking forward to the death, burial, and resurrection. And, and God was applying that to their record, the blood of Jesus, before it had even been shed. Then why were they doing these bloody animal sacrifices? It wouldn't make any sense. Just because God saw through his foreknowledge that he would shed his blood for our sins doesn't mean he went ahead against, uh, uh, doesn't mean he went ahead and, you know, applied the blood of Jesus to the saints before his blood had even been shed on the cross. You know, if you say that they had the blood of Jesus, you're applying the blood of them, the blood of Jesus to them before the blood had even been shed. Hebrews ten twelve through 14, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. The priest back then didn't sit down because he was never finished. Jesus Christ said, you know, it's finished. He finished it, and he sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. When it comes to my standing in Christ, I am perfected forever. I'm sanctified. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Those who draw back unto perdition are those who in the tribulation take the mark of the beast, they fall away. They worship the beast in the tribulation, who's called the son of perdition. They're the ones who draw back into perdition. Chapter 11. Jesus is superior to their Old Testament heroes. You know, some of those Old Testament saints are my heroes. You know, people like Superman. They like the Flash. They like Batman. They like Green Arrow. They like all these superheroes, but I like those Old Testament heroes. But Jesus is also better than the Old Testament heroes in chapter 11. You call this the Hall of Faith. Many people do. And I've always, when I read this, I imagine like I'm going walking down a hallway and I'm seeing a picture of 
Abraham over here. I'm seeing a picture of Enoch on the wall over here. And a little description under their picture of what they've done. But then at the at the end you get to the Lord Jesus Christ. The biggest picture. The greatest achievement. He is superior to the Old Testament heroes. And you also see a superior country in this chapter. But Hebrews 11.1 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And today in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, For we walk by faith, not by sight. You wonder, why don't we have miracles today? Why doesn't God just uh, show his face in the clouds and show me that he's real? Well, we walk by faith, not by sight. In John twenty twenty nine, Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. So you've not seen, but you believe. Peter talks about how whom having not seen, ye love. You haven't seen Jesus, but you love him anyway. I haven't seen Jesus Christ, but I believe he died on the cross for my sins, was buried and resurrected. I believe he's coming back again to set up his kingdom. He'll sit on the throne, and everybody is going to see him in the millennium. Everybody will see him. And you won't need faith to believe then. I don't need faith to know that my pastor is real. I see him. I see him at church. It takes no faith to believe that. When Jesus Christ is physically on earth, you won't need faith. You'll see him. You'll see Jesus Christ face to face, just like Thomas did. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. And the people in this chapter had faith in things that they couldn't see yet. In Hebrews eleven three through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. I go out and I look around and I, I think of that verse in Romans where it says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and God has it that they are, are without excuse. The, in, the invisible things that I can't see are pictured by what I can see. I can look up at the sun the sun rises, just like the S-O-N sun rose. You know, the, the, world's, the world shows me he's real. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. I go out and I look up at the stars at night, and I believe by faith God made that. So that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. The he you see, the heavens were framed by the word of God. He spoke the world into existence. He's before all things, and by him all things consist. In John 1, 1 through 3, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. He made it all. And I believe that he did. Through faith, I believe it. This is the faith chapter. It goes into the faith of all these Old Testament heroes, but there is a better hero. Hebrews 11.4, By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained a witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it being dead yet speaketh, by it he being dead yet speaketh. You see, Abel bought, brought a bloody animal sacrifice. Cain brought the fruit of the ground. Jesus Christ is an even more excellent sacrifice than what Abel brought. He brought his own blood. God's blood. Hebrews 11.5 By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God because he had faith. Enoch walked with God. He was not for God took him. He pictures born again believers who are alive when the rapture happens. If you're alive when the rapture happens, then you'll never die, just like Enoch has never died. It says in Hebrews eleven six, But without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith Noah, 
being warned of God of things not seen as yet. So he was warned of God of things not seen as yet. I mean, it had never rained before. But Noah believed that there was gonna, God was going to bring a flood. And he was moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Noah had the fear of the Lord. And that is what moved him to build the ark. He had faith that the Lord really was going to bring a flood even though it hadn't ever even rained. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and he went out not knowing whether he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promises in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He wasn't looking forward to the cross. He was looking for a city. By faith, Moses, Hebrews eleven twenty four. by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Moses could have been a top dog and enjoyed the pleasures of Egypt, but he chose to do what the Lord said instead. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Notice it only tells you the good things about these characters here. It doesn't tell you about Abraham laughing at what God said or Sarah laughing at what God said. It doesn't tell you about, you know, Moses being afraid at first. It only tells you about the good things because God's wiped all their sins away. Chapter 12, you got a superior father. Hebrews 12, 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. You see, when you're carrying around your pet sins, you aren't laying aside every weight and sin. It's like a marathon runner carrying a backpack full of bricks it's hard to run the race that way and it says in hebrews 12 2 looking unto jesus the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is set down the right hand of right hand of the throne of god jesus christ endured the cross this should encourage you to endure some things endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Take up your cross daily and endure the cross. And ye have forgotten the exhortation, which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom... The Father chasteneth not, but if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? You see, growing up, you had a father that you feared. You feared when he got that belt out. You feared when he got the paddle out. How much more should you fear your heavenly father? And the chastening he gives you is a good thing. And it should make you want to do better. Not rebel. Not despise it. When God chastens you, don't count it as a bad thing. The chastening of the Lord is what keeps you in line. And the scariest thing that can happen to a Christian is for God to just leave him alone and not chasten him. Imagine if a parent left their child alone and let him do whatever he wanted without getting checked. How, do, how would he usually turn out if that happened? He would turn out not so good. The Lord is a superior father. If you can obey your earthly father, how can you not obey your heavenly father? Chapter 13, a superior lifestyle. As a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are called to live a better lifestyle. Jesus did a much superior lifestyle. 
Hebrews 13, 2, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. If you can entertain angels unawares, then you're most likely entertaining a lot of things unawares. Even lost souls who are watching you. You can entertain angels unawares because they look just like regular men. When an angel shows up in the Bible there, they're called men or young men or young man, and they don't have wings and they don't have halos and they're, they're men, but they're angels. And you can entertain them unawares. And you are, can be in your room and you think you're alone, but you're not alone. There's spirits in there. The Lord's eyes are in there. Somebody may be even be looking at you, another person, and you don't even know about it. You need to have a superior lifestyle than the lost world because Jesus did. It says in Hebrews thirteen four through 5, Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Are you going around and, and committing adultery and being a whoremonger? And then it says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. You need to put these things away. Have a superior lifestyle, a better lifestyle. If your conversation is without covetousness, then that means your manner of life is a life of being content with such things as ye have. And, the, and Paul said, godliness with contentment is a great gain. And if you're content with your wife then your the marriage bed is undefiled. You are enjoying it with the wife that is yours and not somebody else's wife. And if you stick with the wife that is yours, then you're being content with such things as you have. And since the marriage bed is, undefi is undefiled and honorable in all, godly, you, you got godliness and contentment. It's your wife is yours and you're content with her. Godliness with contentment is great gain. People are so discontent with their spouse. Why do you think the Bible says for a woman to be in subjection to her own husband? Because they have a tendency to want somebody else's. It says, uh, talks about men, says, Men love your wives, be not bitter against them. You know, people have a tendency to want everybody else's wife. People have a tendency to want everybody else's husband. And they can't keep their eyes off of everybody else's spouse. And even like I see, like even I've seen like pastor's wives uh, uh, post pictures of like celebrity men and basically lusting, talking about how they're lusting after them getting turned on by them. They don't say that, but it's obvious. I'm thinking, how does this how does this look to the women in your church? Such a great example. You're posting pictures of yourself lusting after these other men that's not your husband. That's just weird to me. I mean obviously people are sinful and those things happen. But when it's taken a step further and it's publicized, that's just weird to me. So the reason you have a hard time being content with your spouse is because you're so busy looking at everybody else's. If you quit looking at everybody else's, maybe you'd like yours more. Or quit focusing on their bad things and start focusing on their good things. You see, before you married somebody... All you thought about was their good things, and you overlooked all their bad things, right? Then you got married to them, you started focusing on the, all their bad things, and you forgot all their good things. You take all their good things for granted. And that's why a lot of times it does some good for people to maybe hang out with another couple, like go on a, like take their spouse on a, like an outing with another couple. That way they can see how sorry, how really sorry everybody else's spouse is. And then maybe they appreciate theirs more. I've seen that work for some people. They're like, well, you aren't so bad after all. I've seen the way he talks to her. Or I've seen how she, she runs her husband in the ground. And they find out their spouse isn't as bad as they think they are because they've spent all this time 
thinking on the bad things that their spouse does instead of remembering the good things. But marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. Let your conversation be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. And that's right next to that verse about marriage. I think that's one of the biggest things people aren't content with is their spouse. But be content with such things as you have. Have a superior lifestyle. Don't be like this lost world of people who just openly desire somebody else in the marriage. And they got to go get these romance novels and read them. They got to watch these shows that have some stud on there so they can dream about him because they just hate their husband so much. You know, be content with such things as you have. And have a better lifestyle. Jesus had a better lifestyle than everybody else. He did no sin. Neither was God found in his mouth. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. For we, for we have such an high, high priest who became us who was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. He was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He had a better lifestyle. He's superior all the way around. That's what the book of Hebrews is about. Jesus bringing in better things, being superior to everything. 